The two theories of gravity in use today are Newton's theory of gravity and general relativity. Let's use them as an example. Newton's theory describes the mutual attraction of all massive bodies. It is taught in school, but it is considered outdated. The prevailing theory is general relativity, which suggests interpretation of gravity in terms of curved spacetime. Thus, Newtonian intuition about gravity was replaced a century ago, but intuitions of general theory of relativity can be replaced as well. Physicists hope that someday a new theory will emerge, taking into account gravity as well as quantum effects. At the same time, Newtonian description of gravity still retains high practical utility in engineering or astronomy. Let us answer a question. What is invariably established in physics? While Newton's theory was allegedly refuted, mathematical relationships between measured quantities are still true in original domain of their validity. They are special cases of general relativity for small masses and energies. In this sense, physics discovers immutable knowledge, universal order of world. In this sense, physics makes constant progress, as when the experiment forces theory to be modified, valuable inheritance of abstract, descriptive parts is taken over by the new theory. Meanwhile, explanations and images are refutable and unnecessary. That is method of physics according to Duhem. Universal, unchanging order among measured quantities is being described by theory. Images and explanations are contingent, uncertain, and secondary. Duhem's historical thesis answers following question, how this most important part of physics came into being. Not physics as a whole social process, but this specific method. That is the great riddle. First thinkers to be credited with successful understanding of the order of the world were Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, three great Greek philosophers. Socrates and Plato were first to point that to truly explain natural phenomena is to explain why they look the way they do. Why it's better for planets to move in regular patterns. Why it's better for stones to fall downwards in straight lines. Regularity was explained by purposeful order, which was adopted by Aristotle too. The notion of deliberate purpose, of final cause, works well to describe organic world. Oak trees turn leaves towards the sun and produce acorns so that new trees may grow. Cats hunt mice to get food. People work according to purpose and plan as well. Similar understanding of the physical world seemed a natural approach. Thus, Plato argued for a purposeful, organic vision of nature. Aristotle adopted this program with few critical innovations, trying to answer how we can get immutable knowledge about the world. Despite the fact that the world is changing, he answered as follows. Purposeful relationships are constant and can be known through observation. Thus, Aristotle introduced empiricism against the opinion of his master Plato. This allowed Aristotle to discover some laws of physics correctly, but he also made serious mistakes. Aristotle claimed that internal nature causes stone to fall, which is not a great description for gravity. He explained geophysical and meteorological phenomena by comparing Earth to a living creature with flatulence and intestinal gases. Similarly, the heavens were moved by living godlike creatures. This was consistent with typical pagan point of view, shared by Neoplatonists, Stoics, or Claudius Ptolemy. To formulate scientific definitions, Aristotle took great care to define everything by concrete objects and qualities. He defined locomotion as a change of place. What is the place? His definition of place is a layer of matter around a given object. Similarly, the time was defined as a quantity of change or motion per analogy to the length of a line. In this way, Aristotle would claim that time really exists in change or motion as length exists in line. We see that Aristotle has an erroneous vision of the order of the world. This world is organic and animate. Means of the description are wrong as well, based on relations of visible things, not measurable things. Modern physical quantities aren't similar to the notions of Aristotle. Aristotle's terms are defined by the concrete. Physical quantities are abstract theoretical interpretations. Let us consider an example of temperature measured by thermometer. We consider a set or equivalence class of bodies being just as warm. Beyond the class, we have bodies warmer or colder. These are joined in classes as well. Each class is given a number. Every class has a bigger number than any colder class and lower number than any warmer class. Next, a working hypothesis is introduced. If two bodies come in contact with each other, warmer cools down while cooler body heats up. And another hypothesis that some bodies contract or expand under the influence of heat. 
That interpretation allows us to measure temperature as expansion of a certain quantity of liquid. This is how a thermometer works. Similar analyses can be found in scholastic philosophy. John Bassels, a Scottish Franciscan active in first half of 14th century, demonstrated that heat is a quantity, not a quality of similarity to perfect form of heat, as Aristotle would claim. If two hot blocks of metal are put in contact with a cold block, the heat of the cold block will be greater compared to the case when one hot block is put in contact with the cold block. Thus, heat is subject to addition, like mathematical quantities are. Place of 14th century scholastics is not a layer of matter containing the body, but a relation of equivalence of subsequent layers. It is clear that layer of water that surrounds a stake driven into the bottom of the river is subject to constant change as water flows with a current. Meanwhile, the stake is immobile, so it should have immobile place. Thus, place needs to be a relation of equivalence of subsequent layers of water, or it could be an imaginary layer around the stake. A conclusion followed. Motion can be described in purely relative terms without absolute space. Notion of time has changed as well. Aristotle has imagined time per analogy to the length, and this hindered him from comprehension of instantaneous velocity, velocity at a specific point of time. This is precisely his answer to Zeno's arrow paradox. Trying to answer how it is possible that a moving arrow does not move at any point in time, Aristotle concludes that time has no points, so the question is absurd. Conclusion of this argument is that instantaneous velocity is inconsistent as well. Scholastics understand measurement of time as analogy among durations of changes in the real world. In this way, they can conceive instantaneous velocity and rates of changes of any other quantity. Another 14th century scholar, Nicole Oresme, introduces very simple graphical integral calculus and applies it to the description of motion. He demonstrates that average velocity in accelerated motion is arithmetic, mean of initial and final velocity. He even considers certain non-uniformly accelerated motions, such as this one, given by improper integral. In this case, body in geometrically decreasing intervals of time achieves greater and greater velocity, up to infinite value. Oresme demonstrates that this integral converges. Oresme also paves way to Copernicus and Nicholas Cusanus by introducing innovative theories of gravity, diurnal motion of Earth, and multiplicity of worlds. Jean Bourdon refutes natures of inanimate bodies and introduces the theory of impetus that serves as foundation to the notion of momentum and kinetic energy. Aristotle claimed that the cause of motion of a moving body is disturbed air. Buridan refutes this opinion by everyday observation. A spinning grindstone is not being pushed by air, nor is a javelin with two pointed ends. Thus, rather a persistent quantity of motion keeps the grindstone moving. The heavens, Buridan says, don't need living beings to move them. It is enough that God gave impetus to every celestial sphere so that their motion continues to this day. At the foundation of these discoveries, we can find philosophy very similar to the method of modern physics, derived by theologians and philosophers of the 13th century. First of all, the theology pointed to universal, comprehensible order of the world in which God disposed everything according to measure, weight, and number, as Book of Wisdom says. Secondly, Franciscan theologians derived contingency thesis. If something can be conceived, then God would be able to do it, so it is not impossible. All the Aristotelian claims of necessity and impossibility were rejected, and this allowed deep revision of physics that we have described above. Thus, critical parts of the method of physics, existence of order of world, and contingency of explanations and pictures are derived from Catholic theology. That is the Duhem thesis.